morning, KPFA listeners, and welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental public affairs program co-hosted by the Earth Island Journal and KPFA. This show is coming to you from 94.1 FM, KPFA Berkeley, 88.1 FM, KFCF Fresno, and around the world live and archived at kpfa.org. My name is Fiona McLeod, and I am the host and producer of today's show, And joining me today is Annika Weber, a youth leader who was recently recognized for her accomplishments in the environmental movement by the 2022 Brouwer Youth Awards. Thank you so much for joining me, Annika. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction to the Brouwer Youth Awards mostly, and then we can dive right in. Um, For listeners who may not be familiar, The Brower Youth Awards is an annual award ceremony, which since 2000 has recognized over 130 outstanding youth leaders who are engaged in work across the environmental movement. And this year's Brower Youth Awards theme was resilience. And Annika, I'm so excited to have you join me today. And um, I'd like to just kind of invite you to share about the project that you were recognized uh, by the Brower Youth Awards for, but first to just introduce yourself and tell us who you are, how old you are, where you where you live, all that good stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Annika Weber. I'm from Seattle, Washington. I'm 18 years old. I uh, just graduated high school. Right now I'm on a gap year and then I'm heading to college in the fall. And yeah, that's a little just a bit about me. I like to play the cello. I like to be outside and I have a um, 16 year old brother. <laughs> nice. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your work and your project that you were recognized yeah. for by the, by the youth awards? Sure. So I helped launch and lead the Northwest carbon neutrality task force, which is a group of students, faculty, and parents at my school, the Northwest school in Seattle. Um, and basically we, we researched for over a year, Um, how to become carbon neutral by 2030 without the use of offsets. And then we've actually adopted that goal as a school and started implementing it. So that involved um, doing a lot of like deep research, greenhouse gas emissions, inventory, solar cost savings, writing a report, presenting to school leadership. And now we're also trying to expand this to other schools and sort of share our process because we would be the first um, K through 12 school in the country to public publicly commit to a goal like this without the use of offsets. That is so amazing. Can you talk a little bit about um, some people, probably a lot of people listening know what offsets are, but can you just tell some listeners who may not be familiar, what are carbon offsets and why is it important that um, your program doesn't involve the use of carbon offsets? Yeah. um, So offsets are basically where you buy an emissions credit to reduce emissions somewhere else. So a lot of big companies use them right now. Um, Like if they have a goal to like be carbon neutral by 2030, for example, um, they'll like buy a credit to like plant trees somewhere else or invest in renewable energy somewhere else. Trees are the ones that like you hear about the most. Um, But the reason we didn't want to be involved in that is then you're not really holding yourself accountable or your school or company accountable for reducing emissions. You're just putting it off in other countries. And often that's um, countries in the global South, global majority countries. And that's kind of like a form of climate colonialism in a lot of cases. So we didn't want to be involved in that. That's amazing that you were able to lead your school in this process. Um, I'm really interested to know more about what some of the kind of specifics of how your school made this transition were. Um, I know there was a pretty big like student agriculture component and a lot of research um, and education, as you said. So I'm wondering if you can just share about what the what the process was like and um, what the kind of day to day of implementing it was. Yeah, so we actually haven't implemented it completely yet. We've started implementation. Um but a lot of like the the thing that we have started implementing is the sustainable agriculture also shifting our um, heating from natural gas to electric. So the first thing we really did was um, this might be a bit too much in the weeds, but we divided the emissions into scope. So emissions that we control as a school, like directly, then um, electricity and then indirect emissions like commuting, things like that. And that helped us kind of get an idea of what we were even dealing with. And then we could decide what we wanted to focus on. So we decided we wanted to reduce all of our emissions or sorry, like eliminate all of our emissions. Um, So then we just had to look at like bus data, natural gas, like um, 
bills, stuff like that. Um, and then just like do a lot of research about climate solutions, basically, which was really cool for me because I didn't know that much. And then also do some like um, data collection. Um, people were doing research on energy use efficiency, things like that. We compiled that into a report and then figured out how to present that report in a concise way to the school leadership and surveying our school community to get back up because a lot of them were super enthusiastic. And then we could bring that to the school leadership and say, hey, like 75% of our school think we should take climate action. And that was really powerful. That's amazing. And so I think a lot of listeners will be really excited. Hopefully we have some youth listeners right now who might be able to encourage their schools to do something similar. And it's exactly. amazing that you're, yeah, that you're part of your project and and the vision for all of this is not just to do it for your one school, but to have this kind of be the pilot for a, a system that can be replicated across schools everywhere. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's amazing. Um, what inspired you to start doing this work in the first place? What was the, what was the reason behind it? I think so. I'd been, I've been involved in environmental activism since like elementary school in a lot of different ways. So first off, that was in like pretty classic, like environmental clubs. And that wasn't super satisfying for me because I just felt like it was too focused on individual action, which is important, but, you know, definitely not the whole story and can lead to no shame and things like that. Um, and then I was involved in two youth-led climate organizations. Um, and those were really, they were like really, I learned a lot through them, but they also, there was like a lot of problems with hierarchy and drama and sort of those things that usually <laughs> um, hamper organizations from having a lot of success. And so then when myself and a couple of other students at my school started talking about this project, it was just like at a time where it felt like a really good way to have a tangible impact um, and like grow my leadership and facilitation skills, which it has. Um, so I was like, yeah, like this sounds like a really cool thing. And a th I think a lot of other students in my school felt that way, which is why I want schools across the country to start these kinds of projects. Cause I think um, a lot of us are trying, but often not having a lot of success. And this is a good way to build skills while also having an impact. That's, yeah, so important. There's nothing like just diving in and doing work to build all of the skills that you get in that. Yeah, and I don't know, the way we did the work, I just think was really successful. Like we started out the project and it was students, parents, and faculty, which is something like the intergenerational piece was super valuable for me. And we had a really clear um, vision and mission that we all came up with together. Um, and then we... I don't know, divided the work really well and had really good relationships, which I think, which I think is important. That's such a powerful story of kind of organizing and mobilizing a huge community around a shared goal and, and kind of having the vision for what it could be. And then the buy-in, like you said, of so many people who share that vision and then having so many different people from all different parts of your school community kind of get involved and, and want to help out and bring their various skills to the project. That's, that's really cool. Um, this may be part of your previous answer. I heard you talking about kind of some of the dysfunctions and organizing and movements, which I think a lot of people are familiar with and can relate to, but um, why do you think that youth leadership is important in movements and particularly in environmental work? Yeah, I, I mean, there are multiple reasons, I think. I think the first one, it's pretty obvious. It's just like, we're going to be affected. Like, we're already experiencing that. Like, I've experienced it for like a lot of my life. And like, I work at an elementary school and I was nannying like a fifth grader and I was talking to him and he was like, yeah, like, I cannot remember a time in my life when I wasn't experiencing these effects. So like in every single organization I've been part of, when youth are involved, there's definitely like an urgency and a passion that comes into it. Um, and sometimes that is like a little bit destructive if there's so much urgency that like um, people are getting burnt out. So I think that's why it's been really good to work with adults too, sort of that nice balance. Um, and then I also think um, 
like I explained in my Brower Youth Award speech, like the reason that I really care about this project and spreading it to other schools is I just think it's a really good way to build youth leadership because we're so young, we're going to be working on like the issue of climate change, climate justice, environmental issues for like the rest of our life at this point. And so building these skills early and getting confident instead of burnt out and disillusioned, I think is really important. I couldn't agree more. Um, that balance of urgency from, as you were saying, like the youth perspective and kind of more traditional experience from adults. Uh, I think it's something that a lot of movements for, or the environmental movement kind of more mainstream environmentalism has not traditionally incorporated youth voices. And I think you make a really good point that you're kind of, and I would say I am too part of this pivotal generation of people who can really see the difference between how it was when we were younger, but we're also still pretty young and haven't, you know, don't have the 50, 60, 70 year lifespan to kind of measure the, the, the change over. And it's this more kind of condensed, um, and really jarring juxtaposition, I think for a lot of young yeah. people right now of like, we didn't used to have fire season exactly. And 10 years ago, we didn't have fire season and now yeah. we do it every year. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always find talking to children, especially who are both so aware of the impacts, but also so kind of straight up about it and, and mm -hmm. don't do a lot of the, um, they don't talk around the issue at all, right? They just kind of observe and provide, I think, this really clear perspective that mm -hmm. adults, any anyone older than the five-year-old that you're talking yeah. about would do well to listen to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's weird because I, I like know a lot of young people who I feel like know so much about the issue and are doing so much more about the issue than I was doing. Like, I was involved, but I think that people who are like elementary schoolers right now have even more urgency. Like there's a girl at the elementary school I work at who was like dressing up as climate change for Halloween, which on one hand is like kind of depressing. On the other hand is like <laughs> really cool, but she like cares so much. So I don't know. I think it goes both ways. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's like an up and coming generation of climate activists just by yeah. nature. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Um, I know that when I, I attended the Brower Youth Award ceremony a few weeks ago in Berkeley and there was a school group there from mm -hmm. one of the local elementary schools and I was sitting in a seat where I could see their faces watching all of you give your speeches and watching, I was watching them while they watched the kind of documentary bios of each of the prize winners <laughs> and they seemed so excited and so amazed and and really energized and I just could see each and every one of them like I know that in you know six years seven years ten years whatever it is those elementary schoolers are going to be taking a stance on on these issues too yeah you know, that was genuinely the best part for me <laughs> yeah I'm sure um well for anyone who might just now be tuning in my name is Fiona McLeod you are listening to Terra Verde on KPFA Today, I am joined by Annika Weber, a recent winner of the 2022 Brower Youth Awards, um, and she's here with me to discuss her accomplishments in the environmental movement. Um, Annika, I'm, I'm dying to know if you see yourself continuing this work. It seems like you're really in it and you're passionate about it and you're not going anywhere anytime soon, um, but do you see yourself continuing and if yes, where do you think it'll lead you next? Are you already in that next step? What's what's your vision for the future? Yeah, I mean, more broadly, I definitely am in it for like a long time. Like it's something I care a lot about. I think that climate solutions are really like unique because they're a way to address a lot of different social justice issues at once. Um, it's kind of like I've, I've heard people say that like there are all these issues like racism, sexism that have kind of like come into this culmination of climate change. And I think that's kind of a good way to look at it and climate solutions, like not in a silo, but as representative, repre yeah, <laughs> representative of a lot of 
um, other issues. So that's why I care about it. And I, yeah, want to keep working on that. Um, yeah, I'm planning on majoring in something to do with the environment and social justice in college and just definitely want that to be my career. And right now I'm working with 350 Washington, which is more um, political. It's trying to make the legislative process in Washington accessible for people and increase um, grassroots turnout. When it comes to this project, um, one really important part, I think, is leadership transition. So I've been trying to make that happen and like not um, get too involved in what's happening at my school besides like accountability for sure, because it's such a long term process that I think um, like as an alumni, I still have to keep pressing for the like project to be implemented. Um, and then I also I see my role at this point as helping with the outreach and expanding like the impact of the project to other schools. So one part that I really liked about the um, the Brower Youth Awards was that I got connected to a high school senior in Berkeley named Ella Suring, um, and she helped to um, pass like the first funded climate literacy. Um, um, I don't know what it would be called program. Yeah, in the country in Berkeley. And so we've been talking to each other about starting um like a national network of K through 12 high schools, which like Alana Cohen, um, who was one of the winners this year, showed me something similar for colleges. And it just felt like when we had this project, we weren't able to share with schools very easily at all. Um, so that's sort of something that's needed. So we're trying to figure out how to um, launch that right now. That's awesome. I was actually going to ask um, how, if there are people listening who work at a school or who go to a school, is there a pathway for them to either get in contact with you or someone who you work with um, to learn more about how they could kind of help help spread this program or implement something similar in their school? Yeah, I mean, hopefully that network will work. So that would be one way. And then the second way, just more directly, um, we have a website um, that links to our report. And then also we have a lot of documents up there because we want it to be transparent. Um, so I, that website is linked on the Brower Youth Award page on my profile. Um, I'm hesitant to share email addresses on the podcast, but that's one way to access. If you want to just reach out with questions and want resources, I'm happy to send. Perfect. What What is that website name? Um, I don't know what the website name is. It's probably a long URL. So cool. <laughs> yeah, I would just find <laughs> it on the Brown Youth Awards website. Yeah. Great. Sounds good. Um, well, I'm excited to hopefully keep in touch with you and stay, stay with you on your journey and learn about what you're doing next. And that's really great that you're working for 350 Washington, another incredible organization doing really important work. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering, you just talked about kind of seeing younger, younger youth being present at the award ceremony. Um, and obviously being connected to these prize winners. And, and then it seems like you've also been able to connect with other youth who were not prize winners, but who are still engaged in, in, in the environmental movement and interested in engaging in this work. But um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about kind of what was the most meaningful part about being part of that Brower Youth Awards cohort of prize winners. There were, I think, six prize winners. Um, mm -hmm. All of you were doing really different work in so many different facets of environmentalism and conservation and you know freshwater biology and fossil fuel free research and things like that um it was an amazing spectrum of work but um i'm interested in kind of the community aspect of it and and what does that community mean for you and and how have you all engaged with each other yeah I, I would say that the, like the community and inspiration was definitely the biggest thing. Um, and just like, yeah, definitely the difference in all of our projects reminded me that there's not one way to deal with this problem. Like everyone's addressing a similar issue. Yeah. But like from very different um, perspectives and projects. So that was really cool and just refreshing for me to remember because it's easy to get into a box and be like, this is the thing I have to do, which is not very pr productive. Um, and then I also think, yeah, like especially before 
I was like so intimidated, intimidated by what everyone was doing, especially like Alana's is very disruptive and mine isn't as much like it, it was totally a different skill set that we used, even though they were like school projects, both of them. So it was really nice to meet Alana specifically because she is like um, she just turned 22 on the trip. And I really wish I could have met Amara for similar reasons, because like they're finishing college, I'm going into college. So like learning about what Alana was working on kind of gave me an idea of something I could do in college. She mentioned in her video, like putting environmental justice principles into action. And so since I plan on studying that kind of thing, like, like divestment campaigns and fossil fuel research, which she's talking about needs more work at the moment, like that could be a really good thing to do, which was inspiring for me. Um, Yeah. And just like remembering that I'm young and don't have to be on one path and can just try a bunch of different things as long as I'm still having an impact. Definitely. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, that's an unfortunate side of the climate crisis. Is yeah, there, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Opportunities to get involved yeah. <laughs> and impact. But most people, I think, probably go through their lives making small changes which are so important, but um, it's really inspiring to to meet you and to have seen all of your cohort of fellow prize winners who are people who, um, you know, it's climate justice and integrating these principles into your daily life isn't like a a novelty choice that you make. It, it has this yeah. urgency that you're talking about and you've really dedicated yeah. yourself to doing it in a way that's making these huge impacts, whether it's like at your school, kind of transitioning the school to be carbon neutral or for Alana at Harvard with the Divest Harvard movement. Um, Yeah, it's just really inspiring. Yeah, I agree. Um, So the theme of the Brower Youth Awards this year was resilience. And I'm curious what that word means to you. Um. I mean, I feel like in the context of like environmental organizing, probably just like sustainable organizing, like um, not being afraid of mistakes and seeing mistakes as a like opportunity to um, like have feedback instead of feeling like there's been like a lot of failure and now you have to stop and not, I don't know yeah, failure that only leads to like stagnation and trauma, which is what I experienced. Um, And then also, I guess, like being aware that I'm not always going to be feeling like I'm making like spectacular, like (laughs) life changing um, (laughs) actions, um, changing the world or anything, but steadily pressing for change anyway, like there are going to be some moments where I'm like, yeah, like I made a huge impact in some moments. I'm like, wow. (laughs) I don't feel like I'm accomplishing much, but always like, I don't know, like having a long view. I feel like that's resilience. And then also just finding meaning in what you're doing. Um, Yeah, I think that's important for having motivation in the long term and making sure that everyone involved has a lot of motivation, having like a big base. Yeah. Definitely. I think the kind of balance that you were just touching on of um, in order for us to address climate change, right? Like we need both. We need the kind of small scale individual action and we need to recognize the kind of bigger picture yeah. role of corporations, the role of financial institutions, the role of universities and research centers um, that may have an outsized impact on causing climate change, but we can't just address those things, right? Like we all also have to incorporate um, these elements of life of, of how to minimize our own impact every day too. And so I think that balance is really important um, to keep in mind. And I'm glad you brought it up. And yeah. I, I think, I guess also what I mean is just like, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of people get, I don't know, like sometimes I see action as like these huge like climate marches or like these huge like spectacles. And sometimes that doesn't have the hugest impact, even though I mean, it's very, it's a very important part, but like, I've talked to a lot of people, including family members who are like, yeah, that's the only way to take action, which, um, 
I mean, it, it's important, but it's not the only way. Definitely. And I think what you're touching on is like people, everyone has different abilities to address these issues in their various ways. And that's kind of what you were saying about having youth at your school and having teachers and having parents is like in that situation, everyone's coming to the table with different skills and different background and different knowledge and all kind of collaborating together. And also then there's the reality of like different actions are available to different people. And so it's a matter of kind of um, deciding what feels right to you and, and, and really looking at how you can integrate this into yeah. all of our lives, something we should all be mindful of. Yeah. Um, if you could go back in time, whether that's <laughs> five years or 10 years, um, and tell yourself something, you know, now, what would you say? Um, I feel like I'm very proud of how in like the past five years or so, especially in high school, um, I've found things that I feel are like worth my time, even if I'm not like coming up on top or like winning. I feel like um, like in middle school, maybe, for example, I always felt like I had to be perfect. And I still feel like this sometimes, like especially like in organizing spaces too. Like if I feel like I have to be perfect or like, um, yeah, things like that, then that affects my motivation. But if I feel like there's an inherent value in something I'm doing, like social justice for me or learning or like being outside, like, those have value for me regardless of outcome and definitely outcome matters. But um, with that outlook, I can give attention to things more effectively and sustainably. I love that reframing of kind of moving away from perfectionism. Yeah, exactly. Towards a more kind of mindful and embodied way of doing this work. Um, I wonder if there's like a moment that you remember from your work at your school where you felt like that, that kind of like ability to keep that in mind was tested. Like, was there something like a challenge you had to overcome or something unexpected that happened that you really learned from during this process? Let me think. Um, I would feel, I feel like actually graduating was a little bit like that for me. Like I put so much work into this project and it just felt so weird to just leave. But then I like had to keep reminding myself, like it's not helpful if I'm like always coming back and like pestering people. Like (laughs) I need to like let this be a good leadership transition because then it can actually be a sustainable project that gets implemented. And that was like a little bit hard for me because I felt like I was being a slacker or something. But I think it's really important. (laughs) definitely important um and yes I think often really hard for leaders to yeah facilitate that transition but as you're saying it's it's part of movement building is that there's a a future beyond just the single leader right it's exactly yeah snaps yeah (laughs) (laughs) um well that's all the time we have for today's show sadly but if you would like to learn more about Annika's work you can visit BrowerYouthAwards.org. Um, Annika, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much. It was fun. Thanks also to everybody who tuned in to listen. Um, thank you to all the supporters of KPFA who make our independent broadcasts efforts possible. Um, you can find this show and our other episodes of Terra Verde and other KPFA shows in our online archive. Have a great weekend, everyone. Jack Hirschman. And that people, both older and younger than you, a billion strong, will say, we don't want you to make war anymore, anywhere on earth. If you do, we will stop you and your weapons of mass destruction without even a shot being fired. With a majority, you're an unruly child. Go to the corner and learn your lesson. Then, America, finally, you'll be free. Storytelling for social change on KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org.